He's the chair of uh, the Columbia Biological Sciences Department, and he has, before that, he has a very long background in, uh, in the dramatic fields, and uh, he is the author of a book called Ignorance, How Ignorance Drives Science. So I think that that is a good intro and a good uh, segue into Stuart Firestein. Thank you. I think the first thing to do, because this is apparently the last presentation of the season, is to thank Julian and his amazing crew for putting all this kind of thing together. Remarkable. Nice to see such a big turnout for ignorance. Appreciate all the support. It's great. Um, I think it's especially fitting, I must say, that I'm going to present a talk on ignorance at a place called Lucid. So, very fitting, Julian. Very clever programming. So I'm going to talk about ignorance and how it uh, is an important part of science, I think. And I'm going to start off with this old ancient proverb of uh, anonymous uh, origin, which says that it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when there's no cat. And that is, in fact, the case, I think, an apt description of the scientific method, much more apt than the scientific method that you've probably all been taught in high school or somewhere along the line, as if it were some sort of an ordered progression through discovery and experiment, and, and it was all thoughtful. Because in point of fact, what we mostly do is wander around in dark rooms looking for cats that have been more or less reported to be in there, but maybe the reports aren't so reliable. We bump into things, we knock things over, we try and figure out what's going on. Somebody eventually accidentally maybe hits a light switch. You go, oh, so that's really how it looks great. And then off we go to the next dark room looking for the next black cat. And if that somehow or another sounds sort of Samuel Beckett, bleak, awful kind of scenario, it's actually not. It's quite, I don't know, exhilarating, I guess, is the way to, that I can only think about it. And it seems to me that this is not somehow or another the way science is typically perceived. Even though this is the way it's pursued, it's not so much perceived this way. So this was kind of brought home to me initially in my kind of dual role at Columbia University, where I'm a, a professor and I run a laboratory. Any members of my laboratory sitting right down here, in fact, which makes me very nervous. Um, I'm trying to get past that. Um, so in the laboratory, we. Uh, we have a great time. We talk about experiments. We think of ways to uh, test this idea or that idea about how the brain works. We work on the brain in the sense of smell in particular and what it may mean to how the brain functions. And, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's a wonderful time. And it's kind of exhilarating, in fact. At the same time, I teach a course at Columbia called Cell and Molecular Neuroscience One. <laughs> it's a very forbidding sounding title. And it's a tricky course, I have to admit. And, um, and teaching that course, trying to organize a great deal of material, is very interesting, but not, I would say, exhilarating. So the course consists of 25 or so lectures. We use a textbook, this one here, by a famed neuroscientist at Columbia also, Eric Kandel, and his colleagues. Uh, the book is 1,414 pages long. It weighs seven and a half pounds. Just to put that in some perspective, that's uh, a little bit more than twice the weight of an adult human brain, <laughs> but it's a book on the brain, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then, then I give 25 lectures, and of course, because I'm a diligent lecturer, I want to fill them up with facts and information and all that. And then it began to occur to me that, oh, I should put this in, I have one other perspective slide here. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's the book, and that's Darwin's Origin of Species, <laughs> just so you get an idea where we are with this. So, so I do these 25 lectures, they read this book, and, and it be, it became clear to me, it occurred to me at some point, that by the end of the course, the students must have had some sort of idea that basically everything was pretty much known in neuroscience. That's clearly not true. And they must also have thought that this science is largely some kind of an accumulation of facts which we put together in these encyclopedic looking books. And that's clearly not true either. When I go to meetings or when I hang around in the lab, sit at the bar, have a beer, we don't talk about what we know. We talk about what we don't know. So I thought, well, perhaps maybe that's what we ought to talk to students about as well. We ought to tell them something about what we don't know. We ought to tell them about the ignorance. And so I thought, 
I'll teach a course on ignorance. That's finally something I can excel in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is one of my favorite quotes from Marie Curie, who uh, wrote in a letter to her brother after obtaining her second graduate degree, her second graduate degree, mind you, uh, one never notices what has been done, one only thinks about what has to be done. And I thought, well, this is what we should be talking about, and this is what we should be teaching students. We should tell them about, and, and the general public as well about science, that it's what has to be done, what remains to be done, that's really the most interesting part of it. So, um, and so I thought, all right, well, well, we'll try this course in ignorance. Now, I should, I should say, I, I use the term ignorance, of course, at least in part, to be intentionally provocative, of course. So there are a lot of things that ignorance means that are kind of have bad connotations, especially in common usage. And I don't mean any of those, so let's get those out of the way. So ignorance, of course, can mean a kind of stupidity, a willful stupidity, worse than just simple stupidity. It's a kind of a callow indifference to facts, to data, to the way things really are. Uh, it's an adherence to opinions that have no basis in fact. Uninformed, unenlightened, unintelligent. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, that, I know that's a cheap shot, but, but it's an irresistible one. <laughs> so, no, really, I thought for some time about what sort of a graphic I could put up for that little, I couldn't come up with anything else. So, all right, let's get rid of that. Enough of that. So, and so, but the kind of ignorance that I'm talking about is a different sort of ignorance. It's not just an individual lack of information. It's a communal gap in knowledge. It's something that we just don't generally know yet. The data either aren't there, or if they are there, they don't make sense yet. We can't use them to make a prediction, to put them into some sort of a framework. And the, the phrase that I like most is that from James Clerk Maxwell, probably the greatest physicist between Newton and Einstein, who said, I think, if thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every great discovery in science. So it's thoroughly conscious ignorance that I really wanted to talk about with people. And this is what gave rise to this course called Ignorance, which I actually teach at Columbia University. It's amazing what they'll let you get away with there. <laughs> so, so I teach this course. They pay me to teach this course. It's remarkable. We, the course meets once a week uh, for two hours in an evening. And most of the course um, consists of my having uh, members of the science faculty at Columbia or people who are coming through town visiting come in and talk to students for two hours about what they don't know. But, but not just about what's not known in their field, although that's part of it, not the big questions, not things like what is consciousness or how did the universe begin or these other big things that nature and discovery and all that do so well. The idea was to have a sort of case history of ignorance. What is it specifically that you don't know and why do you care about that? I mean, why is it that you want to know this and not that? Why is this more important to know than that? What will happen if you know this versus that, or that versus this? What will happen if you don't know it? What didn't you know 10 years ago that you know now? What didn't you know 10 years ago that you still don't know now? And so that was how this course worked. And it's been a remarkable experience, I must say, for me, tremendous learning uh, experience for me as well, because we've had a vast array of scientists come through, astronomers, biologists of all sorts, uh, mathematicians, chemists, ecologists, geologists, um, astrophysicists, and so forth. And, and somehow or another, we've been able to talk to all these people. Now, I have to tell you that when it comes to ignorance, I'm, I'm really no better off than anybody else in this room for the most part, because really, I'm a biologist, I'm a neurobiologist, I work in the, the field of olfaction, and I'm okay at reading papers in that area, and maybe a little bit of neurobiology, but there's an awful lot of biology in general that I can't decipher, and certainly a physics paper, I'm no better at reading a physics paper than the members of tonight's band. Maybe worse, in fact. I, mean, I don't know them. Maybe they can read it. Well, but I mean, than any, anybody in general, than a musician or anyone else. So I'm, I'm certainly no better than, than anyone else at doing that, and neither are any of us. So we all have a certain level of ignorance, but we want to be able to get to the science somehow. We want to make it, I mean, science is a clearly a critical part of our culture. We, um, we depend on it in many ways, we rely on it in many ways, it uses us in many ways, as Mark told you, and so we should know about it and we should have access to it. So, so let me talk about a, a model or two of science that I think don't make sense in this regard. This is a kind of a common idea about science that what we're doing is peeling away sort of the layers of an onion to get to some fundamental truth at the, at the center of things. Or another one is this, uh, this iceberg picture, which is a great picture, but suggests that really all we know is the very tip of the iceberg, that most of it remains hidden underneath. I don't actually think either of these is particularly correct, much like the 
the puzzle idea that we patiently piece puzzles together in science. You know, and the thing about puzzles is, with puzzles, the manufacturer has guaranteed that there's a solution, and that's not really the case when you're doing science, it seems to me. So I don't think any of these images exactly catches what's really the, the case in science. It's more like, if you'll pardon my being a, a tad poetic here, it's more like sort of ripples on a pond, where you think of knowledge as being the inside of that circle, but as it grows, as knowledge grows, in fact, so does ignorance, so does the, the, the circumference of that circle that's in touch with the ignorance outside. And so in science, at least, and I think in many other areas, we can think that knowledge actually creates ignorance. In fact, the best knowledge creates the best ignorance, and that's the idea. Science really is there to generate ignorance. This is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. I like this particular slide because I get to name drop of like three names here. So George Bernard Shaw used this at a dinner quote, a dinner, a toast for Albert Einstein in which he said science never solves anything. Just every time it comes up with an answer, it creates 10 new questions, which I find kind of glorious, I must say. I have to say now to name drop a third name in here that, that he actually cribbed this from Immanuel Kant, but <laughs> what are you going to do? I mean, Shaw was good at cribbing stuff. So this was the idea of question propagation, that that every answer actually begets more, every good answer begets more and more interesting questions. Um, this is a, another one of these quotes. So we might think about what then are the limits to ignorance rather than the limits to knowledge. One of the best quotes in this area was actually from this character, who you may also remember, Don Rumsfeld, who uh, talked about when we started uh, a war in Afghanistan there, uh, talked about uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. The idea that there are things we know we don't know, but there may be things we don't even know we don't know. And learning about the things we know we don't know, or we, the things we don't know we don't know, is a real kind of progress. That's where science really progresses. That's, in my opinion, the real frontier. Um, which was also said in a similar way by a very famous mathematical biologist, J.B.S. Haldane, was one of the early evolutionary biologists, um, early supporters of Darwin, who said not only is the universe queerer than we imagine, it's queerer than we can imagine. And certainly queerer than that suit that he's wearing. <laughs> so, so, so the point is that are we in some way or another constrained, I guess, by our cognitive capabilities? So, of course, Copernicus showed us that uh, the Earth isn't at the center of the solar system or the center of the universe or some remote little location. And a, a philosopher of science named Philip Rescher at the University of Pittsburgh came up with the phrase cognitive Copernicanism to suggest that maybe our mental landscape is no more privileged than our physical position in the universe either. I mean, for example, it would be no trouble for, well, it wouldn't be so easy for me, but the members of my laboratory could easily teach a rat to go down a maze and turn into every other, every other opening. That wouldn't be such a big problem. But it would be extremely difficult, I think impossible, to teach a rat to go down a maze and turn into every opening represented by a prime number. Actually, there's a large number of students I don't think I could teach that to, <laughs> let alone a rat. But you see where the, where the limitations lie. So let me give you a kind of an example of this of this kind of limitation with a story from a famous philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who once on a stroll with a friend apparently said, you know, it's always puzzled me why it is that it took people so long to figure out that the earth rotates and the sun stands still. And that's what, why it looks like it goes across the sky, but it's the earth that's rotating and the sun that's standing still. And his friend says, so the story goes, his friend says, well, Ludwig, I mean, it just, it looks that way, right? I mean, that is how it looks. And so Wittgenstein says, really? Well, so what would it have looked like if the earth rotated and the sun stood still? Because that's clearly what's going on. So that's what it should look like. So this may sound like, well, are we just too dumb to figure this out? But actually, it's not at all trivial because it really does look like that. And it does seem like that to our senses. Um, indeed, I think it would be very, and I've actually done this in a room full of scientists. So I don't know, there may be somebody in here who knows the answer to this. But I've never found a room full of scientists who know the answer to this, which is if you right now had to turn to the person next to you and explain to them how it is you're sure that the Earth rotates and the sun stands still without recourse to pictures from the space station or something like that, how would you explain this to them? How would you tell somebody this? 
not really so trivial an explanation to make. I didn't know how to explain it, so I looked it up on Wikipedia, of course. And it <laughs> turns out that it's Foucault's pendulum is actually the first proof in 1851 in Paris when Foucault uh, uh, suspended a pendulum from the ceiling of the Pantheon where there's curiously a black cat there at the moment as well. I don't know where that came from, but that's where it is. I actually took this picture. Um, and so suspending this pendulum from the roof of the Pantheon, and so it can swing free in any vertical plane, you can actually then watch the Earth, essentially, watch the Earth turn under the pendulum. And it stands today as probably the best proof that the Earth is what's rotating and the sun is standing still. So you can see how difficult it can be to come up with these um, to come up with these perceptions when our sense organs, our brains, which were meant, of course, for hunting and gathering, not chemistry and calculus, uh, come up against these perceptual difficulties. So I would say to you, science is basically the search for better and better ignorance, and that's what we're interested in, higher and higher quality ignorance, because old ignorance is not the same. There's kind of low quality crap and there's high quality ignorance, and you want the high quality stuff. And this is what scientists, I think, mostly argue about. Sometimes we call these arguments grant proposals, sometimes we call them bull sessions, whatever, whatever the term is, this is what we mostly argue about. But I think the important thing not only for scientists to recognize and students of science, but for the general public to recognize as well, is that at some point we have to abide by a certain amount of ignorance. So I like this quote from, from the poet John Keats who who's, uh, uh, identified this idea of negative capability, which is this, this ability to, to be in a state of mystery or you say ignorance, of being in uncertainties and mysteries and doubts with no irritable reaching or grasping. Now we may irritably reach and grasp in science, I'm not so sure about that, but Erwin Schrodinger, the physicist and sometime philosopher, uh, famous for Schrodinger's cat, sort of updated it for science when he said that if, in, any, in any search for, um, through science you have to abide by a certain amount of ignorance for a certain amount of time, and I think that that's clearly the case. So finally, we come back to, I think, the idea that science is a generation of ignorance, that this is what drives it, that this is the most important part of it, and that you shouldn't feel left out of science because you can't master a huge edifice of facts or a huge amount of data or you don't have five PhDs because you can still be part of the adventure. I think we all can by thinking about the questions that are out there and, and the way to get to these questions and the search for black cats in dark rooms that may not in fact, be there. So thank you, and I'd love to take some questions. Well, uh, yeah, I screwed that thing up there. I should drop that on the floor. I busted that. Yeah. Hello? There we go. We're fixed. Uh, science. That's, that's, that's what Ray would have done. Uh, yeah, so my first question is, how do I sign up for your class? That was terrific, really great. But I think there are better questions somewhere out in the audience. Oh, come on now. There's one behind, uh, There's behind one the column. There's one behind the column. Yeah. There we go. Well, my question is, if you decide, or you inspire ignorance in your class, so how are you going to make Right, so the, so the question is sort of, um, this is fine for science or in a class like ignorance, but how can we apply this every day, right? I mean, where, can, where else can it be applied? And um, so, I mean, I'm a scientist, so I wrote this about science. I wrote this book about science and the, the role of ignorance in science, but I do believe that, of course, it's true virtually everywhere. That, that in the age of Google and Wikipedia and whatever's gonna come after it, when, when access to facts is, you know, just a click away or, I don't know, eventually we'll just ask the wall or whatever it is we're gonna do to find out some bit of information or fact. How do we, how do we learn to think beyond the facts? How do we learn to take a step beyond the fact and see what's the real, what, where does this fact lead us? Where does this answer lead us? So I don't mean, of course, to demean facts. Facts are important, scientists do come up with facts. You need to learn a lot of them to be a scientist. You need to learn a lot of facts to be a lawyer or an accountant or anything else as well. Um, but knowing a lot of facts doesn't make you any of those things, just makes you a geek, really, kind of. You know? <laughs> so, so to be a scientist or to be anything else, I think you have to learn how to take those facts, how to take answers and find the next question. Um, this is just sort of a bromide, I guess, which may not be a real answer, but there's a wonderful quote from uh, a story about Gertrude Stein who was being wheeled into potentially life-threatening surgery, and her lifelong companion, Alice B. Toklas, said, Gertrude, what's the answer? And Stein said, 
what's the question? And I think that's the important way to think whenever you possibly can. But it takes, you have to hiccup to do that. I mean, you have to stop yourself and think, no, no, let's not worry about the answer. Let's worry about the question. Question. So the question has to do with the idea that what scientists do is create models, or I guess what used to be called hypotheses, and how do you, how do you incorporate ignorance into this? So I, uh, I'm going to make a sort of a bold statement. I detest hypotheses. I think a hypothesis is the worst thing that's ever happened to science. Um, it's really, and, and it's a disaster because the funding agencies, the government funding agencies in particular, where a lot of science is supported by your tax dollars, thank you, um, <laughs> use this idea that science should be hypothesis driven. This is what, this is the phrase that's actually used. And I think it's a bad idea. I think a hypothesis or a model in some case is somebody's best cute idea about how something might work, how a bunch of facts that we don't really have a whole handle on yet might work. And then you do some experiments to try and figure that out and revise the hypothesis. That's the idea. Nobody really works that way. I mean, how many times have I said to you guys, it's my lab sitting here, well, let's get the data and then we'll figure out what the hypothesis is because that's just as commonly the way it works, right? So, um, and the problem with the hypothesis is once you have one, because it's your cute idea, you become kind of connected to it. You become kind of invested in it. And then I think it creates a kind of bias, either intentional or unintentional, but you begin thinking of experiments that will support that hypothesis or model. You begin sort of paying more attention to the data that supports it and a little less to the stuff that goes against it, and pretty soon you, you have this big bias built into it. I would say that science should be curiosity driven and it should be a big fishing expedition. But if you ever get comments like that on a grant proposal, you're dead, you're finished. <laughs> so I don't know what to say except that I think it's wrong the way it is and it ought to be the other way. Fishing expeditions is where we ought to go. Let's take one more question in the back. You know, it's like 9.30 here, what? <laughs> I had a lot to drink, you know. It might not seem that way. But, yeah. All right, all right, I got it. Everyone got that? So the question was about reductionism. Is that okay? And that we can keep getting more and more focused and more and more narrow. And, and one can, although just as often. So. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do science, and that's one of the wonderful things that I've learned actually teaching this course is that scientists actually turn out to be quite idiosyncratic in the way they go about it. There are scientists who like really big questions of, of some enormity, and there are other scientists who like to pick away at some little scab for as long as they possibly can and solve that. And, and, and actually, they both work somehow or another. Uh, it, it, it's really a matter of taste as much as anything else. So I've watched reductionist and reductionist science go on and on and on and finally come out the other end with a rather big theory. I mean, uh, in neuroscience, learning, I would say, is a good example of that, where we've reduced it to proteins and a little bit of squirting and a little bit of stretching and things like that, you know. And, and you can really describe these things in, in unbearable detail. But on the other hand, it really explains a very large concept like like learning. I would say, just to give a very quick historical example, example Kepler, um, famous astronomer, spent, I think, eight years of his, six years of his life uh, uh, battling with eight degrees of arc in the sky. Eight degrees of arc in the sky is about half your thumbnail when you hold it out there. Because he recorded the movements of the planets and he figured out that they were off by like eight degrees of arc. And he battled and battled with this and finally recognized that planets move around the sun in ellipses not in circles. So this is a really, really small kind of a question, and yet it freed physics from the tyranny of platonic circles, the perfect circle, and there would have been no Newton, there would have been no laws of force had it not been for Kepler and his eight degrees of arc showing that it was an elliptical movement rather than a circular one. So I think you never really know. You, dig, you drill deep, but you then you hit something big sometimes. There's plenty more to read in the book. Ignorance. Thank you. Stuart, thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you.